Welcome to those of you who are starting to sign in. We're gonna start in just a few minutes. We're gonna give a, a couple additional minutes for folks to get settled and, and log into the webinar before we take off. All right, let's get started. Thank you for joining us in this webinar about financial aid for music students. My name is Stephen Campbell. I'm the Director of Admission for the Lamont School of Music. And Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you again, um, Echo Stephen. My name is Alex Robinson. I'm the Assistant Director of Financial Aid. So our offices do have a nice little partnership and Stephen will dive into that. Yeah. So. Many of you probably already know this as you've kind of started your admission process. <clears throat> we do kind of have uh, this relationship between the Financial Aid Office of the University of Denver and the Lamont School of Music Office of Admission. And we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of what office does what. Uh, we're gonna talk about kind of how our processes differ and are the same. And so Alex, if you wanna to go to the next slide, we'll start looking at the agenda. To participants, the Q&A is open. Um, if you'd like to drop questions in there at any time, that is, that is uh, welcome. If uh, we have a big question session at the end, right? So we may end up saving most of your questions for, for that time. But if, if there's a question that's super pressing and we need to clarify a slide, we will definitely uh, we'll address that in time. So throw them in there as they, as they pop up. So we're gonna talk about which of our offices do which things, right? Lamont Office of Admission or the Office of Financial Aid. How do you, as a student, know the costs of attending BU? What is the difference between the FAFSA and the CSS profile, both of which the University of Denver and Lamont require for um, consideration of financial need? What to expect when you apply for aid? The types of aid that are available? And then what happens next? What are the next steps? So the Office of Financial Aid, broadly speaking, as we get into aid types, the selection make a little more sense. But broadly speaking, uh, federal aid, things that don't necessarily come from the University of Denver, but they're federal or state funds, that's going to be more the Office of Financial Aid, and they're going to process a lot of the documentation. All institutional aid, which we'll talk about more later, will come from Lamont. So Office of Financial Aid, they establish the cost of attendance to attend DU as an undergraduate student. They evaluate each family's ability to pay by determining the expected family contribution, and that's a, a little bit of university jargon that you may be familiar with. And if you're not, we'll, we will definitely talk more about that uh, later on. They offer some grants, uh, loans, and work study, and they, they base it off of that cost of attendance and the expected family contribution. And then they distribute resources in an equitable, man, equitable manner. Excuse me. One of the things that'll be true about both the Office of Financial Aid and the Office of Admission at Lamont is listen. We're here to answer your questions, right? And so even at the end of this webinar, if, if you get to the end and you're like, wait, so if I have a question about this specific thing, who do I who do I reach out to? Either of us, right? We will route it to the right place. Uh, we work together very closely. And so uh, don't worry too much about that, but no questions are bad. So about the Lamont Office of Admission, we award Lamont scholarships. Now, this is a big deal at the University of Denver because it takes into account 
all three of the things you see here. Musical merit, which is based primarily on your audition or your portfolio, the thing that you do for Lamont. Uh, academic merit, which is uh, it's assessed based on undergraduate admissions review of your um, application, your transcripts, all of those things. So they will, they will give us an idea of kind of uh, how your application looks in the non-musical realm. And then financial need, and we will use that ex expected family contribution that financial aid develops um, to determine that financial need. And we, we combine all of these things. So there is no line item for each of these. As an admitted music major, you will get one award, the Lamont Scholarship that takes into consideration all of these things. We distribute resources in an equitable manner and we counsel families on scholarship questions, uh, including financial issues and scholarship requirements. So as we go through this process, I am always available to chat about your specific situation, the questions that you have. And then once you're admitted and have gotten an offer from us, again, I'm here to talk about what that offer means and, and, um, and everything related to that. Uh, finally, determining costs and aid, right? So we're talking about the cost of attendance, which include direct costs, uh, that's tuition and fees. These are things that will be billed to your account, right? So tuition and fees and room and board, depending on uh, your situation, right? And then indirect costs are these books and supplies, transportation, personal expenses. These are um, estimates. They're based on averages of, of, of felt costs from our students. Um, and we want to give you an idea of really what the full price is going to be, not just what we're going to bill you, so that you have an, uh, you have an understanding of really what attending to you is going to ultimately ultimately cost. And so that is the full cost of attendance, direct costs, which is the sticker price, and then indirect costs combined. I'm gonna pass it over to Alex to take us through these next slides. Yeah, Stephen, thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you all for being here. I am gonna kind of get into some of the nerdy stuff um, in the financial aid world. So. This is a quick way, a quick calculation that shows you how we determine financial need. Um, and essentially it is the cost of attendance. So that sticker price that you see when you look up a school on any website, minus the expected family contribution, which we're gonna dive into a little bit later, um, that equals your financial need. So that's the amount of money that the schools try to come up with in order to get you to attend the university. Keep in mind, need varies based on cost. So your need at one school is going to be different than your need at another school that costs a different amount. And also keep in mind, most schools are unable to meet 100% of your need. With just scholarships and grants, you might see that loans need to come into play in order to fill that need gap. So I say that because I wanna lead you to this, this graphic here. Um, this is a graphic that basically shows how need varies based on cost. So if we have schools one, two, and three, school one being the most expensive, school two being in the middle, and then school three being, I guess, the most affordable, if all schools are using your same expected family contribution, if this was in person, I would ask you what, which school would cost the least, but that's not gonna happen here. Um, the answer is all of these schools will cost the exact same amount of money. Um, so this is just a good idea to see a good depiction, how you can see, regardless of a school's cost, if they're all using your, state, your same expected family contribution and they're all meeting 100% of your need, your out of pocket is going to be the exact same. <clears throat> so how do we determine expected family contribution? This is where the FAFSA application comes into play. It's the free application for federal student aid, keyword there being free. You should never pay for the FAFSA application ever. If, if any site tries to charge you for that application, it's more than likely a scam. Um, and it is required to determine eligibility for many federal, state, and institutional aid programs, which can include scholarships, grants, work study, and then student loans. Um, if you haven't completed the FAFSA yet, you can do so at studentaid.gov. It did become available October 1st. So hopefully um, you've done it already or you're planning on getting that done. Families will use 2019 taxes. This is a question that comes up a lot. We get a lot of calls in the financial aid office that say, hey, this, is, this application is for 2021 through 2022. 
you're asking for 2019. That's correct. We want that tax information from that year. A couple of benefits that the FAFSA offers is you're able to use the IRS data retrieval tool. Um, a lot of families are able to utilize this. It allows you to just port your tax information directly in from the IRS if you filed, hopefully you have already from 2019, um, so that you don't have to have your tax return on hand. And there's no need to estimate, which in the past that was kind of a, a big issue. Um, and then special considerations. So a lot of families will reach out and say, hey, you know, my income from 2019 is way different than 2020, 2021, um, certainly due to a pandemic. Well, the FAFSA allows financial aid offices, the Department of Education, excuse me, allows financial aid offices to make adjustments for this. And we call them special considerations. So if, you're, if you get your financial aid offer and you say, hey, you know, I know this was based on 2019 tax information, reach out to the financial aid office because they can certainly adjust those numbers for you. You just can't do so on your own. So don't just want to, don't put in your current information. The financial aid office has to do that. So how is the expected family contribution calculation determined through the FAFSA? This is a very quick rundown of the calculation. Um, it, it looks at your income, both taxed and untaxed. It then provides allowances, meaning it protects it puts it aside for basic living expenses, social security and income taxes paid. It then is gonna take a look at your assets. Um, what's in your savings account, your checking account. You have stocks, do you have 529 plans? Do you own a business? What's that worth? Home value is not included for the FAFSA. So if you've already completed the FAFSA and you added your home equity as an asset, make that log back in and, and wipe that out on the FAFSA. And then it excludes a large portion of these assets as well. So just as it protects income, the application protects assets. And then a couple other factors it looks at is the size of your family and then the number of dependent students that you have in college. The CSS profile is another application that you will hear of if you've applied to a school like the University of Denver. Um, so many private universities and private scholarship providers also require this in addition to the FAFSA application to determine eligibility for institutional aid. This one, unlike the FAFSA, is not free. Um, and the reason that schools do utilize this, mainly private schools, is because a lot of their scholarship dollars are coming less from the state budget and more from their own endowment. So they want to make sure that they're getting a comprehensive look at a family's ability to pay for school. This one, unlike the FAFSA, does look at home equity. So if you fill out both the FAFSA and the CSS profile, this, the FAFSA, you should exclude your home value from the asset calculation. The CSS profile is going to ask what your home's worth, and that will be factored into your ultimate um, expected family contribution. And unlike the FAFSA, the CSS profile does look at both parent information if a family is divorced. So with the FAFSA, if a family is divorced, the, um, the FAFSA says, okay, well, just tell us the custodial parent's information. The custodial parent is considered the parent who the student lived with most in the past 12 months. The CSS profile is going to look at both parents' information. Um, that's just the site for CSS profile. You can also get there through um, cssprofile.org. So that being said, be prepared. Financial aid offices are around to make sure that we can provide students who are eligible for financial aid the aid that they're eligible for. So we will review potentially your salary, how much you made in a specific year, you know, what's in your bank accounts, how much taxes did you pay in a specific year. We might ask for a tax transcript from the IRS, um, home value, investments. These conversations can certainly be uncomfortable. Um, but they are required and they are necessary, frankly, um, in order for a financial aid office to give you what you deserve. So a couple documents that you might need when completing these applications, your federal income tax return. If you are unable to use the data retrieval tool, you will want to have this on hand. W-2s, driver's license information, um, if you have one. If not, you can certainly put in N-A. Um, social security numbers, again, if 
as a parent, if you have, if your student is a, a citizen or an eligible non-citizen, they will have a social. If you don't as a parent, you can put in all zero. So that one doesn't apply to parents who do not have a social security number. And then checking and savings account information. So these are good things to have on hand um, when completing the applications, if you haven't completed them already. So this is a bold point. This is an explanation point because aid is available to make college affordable. There might be rumors or all types of things set aside that you know financial aid just wants to get all my tax information. No, it's we, we need to make college affordable. That's why we work. That's why Stephen and I do what we do. Um, and it's one of the joys that we have about our job. But that's that's why we request these things. That being said, here are the types of aid that you really will see after you go through these financial aid applications. Um, you'll see either scholarships and grants, and I think Stephen can certainly speak to that, Lamont Scholarship. Um, you'll see federal and state grants. These typically go to lower income families in the form of a federal Pell Grant. Loans, um, a lot of families ask the question if they're bad, and the answer in financial aid is no, they're not bad, but excessive borrowing of loans is bad. Um, and it can get you in a little bit of trouble. Um, so on the undergraduate end, you can borrow a direct Stafford loan, a parent plus loan and a private loan. On the graduate end, you're eligible to borrow 20,500 every senior year. Um, uh, to go back to the undergraduate level, first year dependent undergraduate students are capped off at 3,500. Um, in subsidized loans if they're eligible for that, but a total of 5,500 in loans for the first year, a total of 6,500 for the second year, and a total of 7,500 for the third and fourth year. And that's for undergraduate students. And then we have student employment. This is a wonderful, wonderful program that the Department of Education offers. It allows students to work on campus roughly 10 to 20 hours a week. They are paid in the, in the form of an hourly wage. So it's not something, if you see a student employment um, or a work study award on your aid offer, that, that isn't gonna just get deducted from your, from your bill. Your student will have to work these hours, secure a job, and it will reduce, um, and they can choose to pay, uh, use it for living expenses, or they can choose to pay their bill. Um, and I think Stephen, you can speak to this program a little bit. Yeah, I wanted to add, thanks Alex, to, notes on this slide. One is that the most common question that we receive at Lamont about scholarship <clears throat> is, do I, can I stack this with university academic scholarships? And the answer is no, right? Based on that slide way back at the beginning when we were talking about kind of what we look at with the Lamont scholarship, that musical ability, academic ability, and financial need, because we are looking at all of those things and bringing in input from the Office of Undergrad Admission and the Office of Financial Aid, uh, that is the entirety of, of um, the institutional aid that's going to come uh, to music students. So what it tends to be is a larger award, right? Because we're taking into account all of those things. You're getting credit for that, those great grades as an undergrad of that great application essay. And we're taking into account that financial need that, um, that you perhaps show after filling out the FAFSA and CSS profile. So that's the first really big question that we typically get. Um, the other thing is I was just gonna make a note about the student employment. Uh, this really is a great opportunity and it's particularly cool for music students because you can work at Lamont, right? In fact, the vast majority of students that work at Lamont are music students. So in our office of admission, we have a number of work studies that are, that are working with us and getting paid through um, that student employment uh, work study uh, award. And they're getting to see what it's like to work in the music industry. And for many of us who are in um, staff positions at, at DU, and I don't want to speak for Alex or his office, but certainly at Lamont, one of the ways that we got into the career we're in now is because we had a work study award as undergrads or as grad students. And we got a sense for what it was like. We're like, oh, I didn't know you could, I didn't know this was a career. I didn't know you could work at music schools, for example, and, and stay in this industry that we love. And so highly recommend uh, if you get one of those reaching out to uh, Lamont or other areas of campus that you're interested in working and, and, um, and taking one of those jobs. It's a great, great opportunity. It really is. And you could speak for me there because I actually got into financial aid doing work study. So 
Yeah, it's, it's a great opportunity. Um, and DU is certainly working on expanding our work study positions um, to cater more towards, you know, what the market um, is looking for in terms of jobs after students graduate. So what's next? Ensure you're, you've completed your FAST and CSS profile. Obviously we went through that on this slide, um, throughout the slideshow. Um, if you wanna be considered for need-based financial aid. So if, if need-based financial aid is completely out the door for you, you don't think you'll qualify, there's no need to consider this. Um, but if you do wanna be considered for it, make sure you complete these two applications. Check your emails and application status portal for requirements and documents. That's how we communicate. We would love to be able to call every student daily and say, hey, you're missing this. It's just not, it's not feasible. So this is the, the way that we figured out is the best to communicate. Please check your emails and your application status portals. Inform colleges about special circumstances. So as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at your ability to pay based on 2019. If anything has changed since then, and right now it looks like for a lot of families that might be the case, reach out. The financial aid office can certainly make an adjustment based on that. So please reach out and inform us of special circumstances. Investigate and apply for private scholarships. This is another big one. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of schools are unable to meet 100% of your financial need with just grants and scholarships. So these private scholarships can help fill that gap. Um, they can be tedious. You might have to do several applications. When I say several, I'm talking more like 20 to 25 to get a couple, but those couple scholarships can make, those couple private scholarships can make the, the huge difference in filling your financial need gap. Um, music scholarship awards. Uh, Steven, I think you can talk more to this. Yeah, um, a couple things too about the points before it. Alex mentioned that if you don't think you'll qualify for need-based data, it's just not something that you want to be considered, um, then you don't submit the FAFSA and CSS profile. You are still eligible for the Lamont scholarship. If you don't submit FAFSA and CSS, <clears throat> we just won't take into account financial need. We will still look at musical ability and academic ability. We just won't consider financial need. So that's, a, that's an important point about Lamont specifically. Um, the bit about emails, and Alex, correct me if I'm wrong and if something has changed, but uh, the majority of emails will go to the student. There are some that go to the parent, but the majority will go to the student. So um, conscientious, pa conscientious parents out there, ask your students about this because uh, they may be getting emails that, that you're not aware of. And students, we always, of course, want to encourage you to be, um, be the spokesperson for your own, uh, your own education, your own college choice, but we understand that finances are often something that, that um, parents are deeply involved in. Um, yes, music scholarship awards. So the timeline for music scholarship, uh, you are automatically considered if you're a music major and you come and you audition and you apply and all of these things, you uh, are automatically considered for the Lamont scholarship. You only, the only additional things you need to do are the FAFSA and CSS for need-based aid. Um, you'll come through and do auditions in uh, late January, early February on a typical year. This year, of course, we are not doing in-person auditions at Lamont as we, as we usually do, um, simply because of the pandemic and uh, safety. We're doing recorded auditions and then Zoom interviews with the faculty uh, in late January, early February. So that process will run its course. We start making our decisions, uh, usually late February. Um, decisions are made, you'll hear from the university in early March, just a admission decision kind of uh, blanket, yes, no. And then you'll hear from Lamont in uh, via snail mail, and actually paper in the mail uh, about your Lamont scholarship. So that's again, mid-March comes through the mail. As soon as you have that, if you wanna reach out, you have questions about how that works or um, concerns, I, I'm your guy for that. Um, and typically at that stage, you are welcome to reach out to make me your primary contact. Once you're admitted and you've gotten that, that aid, feel free to reach out to me first. And if it's something that Alex would be better suited to answer, then I will, I will forward it on to him and we'll, we'll take care of it. Great, so that's, uh, that's our contact information there. Alex there on top of me. Uh, below that, um, please jot that down if you don't have it already. And again, like that last bullet said, seriously, I mean, we are here to answer questions. Alex mentioned before, you know, we're here to connect people with the school that works for them, right? We're all about trying to make this 
doable for you if this is the place you want to go and if you're admitted and we we want to make it affordable so we're, we're here to be a resource and a support to you um, it is not uh, you are not bothering us to email us questions about how to make this work for you so that's the end of our slides and we'd like to move into a Q&A session if you guys have questions please put them in the Q&A and uh, and we will get to them You know, Alex and I are going to feel really good about our presentation if, if somehow we've managed to psychically answer all of those, all of those questions in uh, in twelve or so slides or however many that was. So please, if, you, if you've got them, you've got them. Put them in the Q and A, and we'll get to them. Ah, good. Um, when are audition videos due? So we are asking for your audition video on the same deadline as the application. So that's January fifteen across the board. Um, we didn't mention this earlier. Uh, music majors are all considered to be a regular decision. So first time, first year students, uh, you cannot do early action or early decision if you're a music major. We will consider you through regular decision. That's simply because that's when we, when our faculty review auditions and we can't make admission decisions without having heard the whole class, right? The whole auditioning class. So Evie, that's gonna be January 15th when you submit your application. Um, please also submit your audition video. You can upload that video on your application status page through the um, edit portfolio functionality that's there. So when you, when you apply, you submit the Common App or the Pioneer App to DU. About 24 hours later, you'll get an email about the Lamont School of Music application. You'll log into your application status page and you'll fill out that Lamont School of Music application. On that same uh, application status page is where you can submit that video. And again, if you, have, if you run into issues, you have questions about uh, how that works, shoot me an email and I can, I can guide you through that. This is a great question. So uh, at other schools, this is the question. At other schools, I've seen that they provide scholarships for making all state bands. And at some schools, these scholarships are taken away. If the scholarship you receive uh, from the school is bigger than the all state scholarship. And does Lamont provide the same scholarship in the same method? So the short answer is, is no. We don't give special scholarships for all state band participation, or it isn't this kind of uh, algorithmic process where if you if you were if you made an all state band participating all, all state band that automatically results in a certain award. However, you'll notice on the Lamont app we ask about your participation in ensembles and your awards that you've that you've given. One of the reasons we ask for that is because we want to take into account the full student, the full application um, when we make our scholarship awards. I am uh, fond of saying that our scholarship process is. Um, very much like our major, uh, a creative process, right? It's not just, it's not scientific in the same way that you're just putting in numbers and spitting out eight or something like that. Um, we really are looking at the full class, a number of criteria and inputs and taking into consideration things like this, all state bands, you know. Um, the other thing about all state band participation is that it shows of course that you were um, one of the best players in your state and that will come through in your audition, right? We will see the level of player you are uh, when you come and play for us. And then of course, we're comparing those auditions across state lines as well. So we do look at the whole picture. It isn't an automatic all-state band scholarship, but certainly making all-state band can't hurt in your application and in your consideration for aid. And I hope that answered your question.
I'll put out a note while, while um, you guys are considering questions if you have them. <clears throat> Music applicants across the country, like every school, um, it can be a little difficult at this stage in the application process, right? Um, and Alex could tell you, right, we have this great net price calculator, these tools online to try and give you an idea of what do you cost? <clears throat> and every, most every school, I believe it's a requirement, right, Alex, that you have something like that um, at a school. Unfortunately, those aren't as those aren't as predictive for music students, pretty much across the board, not just at, not just at DU, because of the music merit part of things, right? We won't know what the entirety of your financial aid package looks like until we hear you do what you do, right? And hear you do what you do in alongside all of your colleagues that are auditioning with you. Uh, and so even if a school doesn't do aid like we do, right? They do stack scholarships of academics, for example, they still won't know the full package, the full financial aid package until, until you audition. Um, the only exception might be a school that meets need and doesn't do academic or musical merit. And so you just know what it's gonna cost as soon as you know what your EFC is that Alex talked about. Um, and so I, I mentioned that just because I know that can be a little bit concerning sometimes for music applicants, but it's, it's meant to encourage you to know that this is not uh, unique, that every music student is really dealing with that level of uncertainty at this stage in the process. Um, and also to not uh, check schools like DU, for example, private schools that are a little more expensive sticker price wise, not check them off your list simply because of the sticker price, because you don't know yet how much it's going to cost you uh, until you get through the process, until you, again, do what you love to do, right? Come and play for us, show us what you, show us what you love to do. And we'll give just maybe two or three more minutes uh, for any of you to answer questions. And if, if none come up in the next couple of minutes, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Actually, I just thought of one other thing that I'd like to share. <laughs> so I believe most of you that are attending today are um, undergraduate applicants. <clears throat> and most of this presentation was in fact, you know, geared towards undergraduate students. But on the off chance that there's an undergrad, or excuse me, a graduate student in, in uh, attendance, or if you watch this later on, um, it's a little different on the graduate side, right? Um, there is no CSS profile for graduate students. Undergraduate or graduates will only fill out the FAFSA, which we do encourage you to do both for eligibility for that um, federal loan that Alex talked about, that $20,000 500, uh, 500 loan. Um, we also take that FAFSA into account with some of our awarding. On the grad side, our aid kind of falls into three categories. There's a graduate teaching assistantship, which uh, is a certain percentage of tuition waiver, and then a stipend, a small stipend. Uh, that usually is given on the basis of work that is performed, usually teaching non-major lessons is what graduate uh, assistants usually do. That's one type of award. We also have graduate dean scholarship, which is, um, there is no work requirement for that. It's just, it's just a type of merit aid. And then finally, Lamont has endowed scholarships that we can award uh, in conjunction with those other two, um, again, on the basis of, of merit typically. Now, Endowed scholarships can be a little more complicated. There are a variety of endowments available to us at Lamont, and many of them have specific requirements. Um, there may be, they may be meant for a specific instrument, or they may require demonstrated financial need, which is why it's a good idea to fill out that FAFSA. Um, you are automatically considered as a graduate student for all of those awards for which you are eligible, right? The only exception is that if you are, uh, there are two GTAs, graduate teaching assistantships in music theory and musicology, that's music history, uh, that require additional application materials, um, which you can find on our website. But typically, uh, students who apply at the graduate level are automatically considered for all of that. And then both at the undergrad and grad level, international students, you are also still considered for all of Lamont's aid. The Lamont scholarship, you're still considered for that as an international student. And uh, on the graduate side, you're still considered for all three of those award types that I mentioned. So just in case graduate students tune into this, uh, that's a quick overview of what we do. And if you have follow-up questions, please shoot me an email or um, drop them in the Q&A. Alex, any final thoughts? It looks like we may be running out of questions. 
Yeah, it does. Um, and if any questions, I know financially it can be personal. So if any questions um, you feel like you want to withhold because it's in a public setting, um, you have our email address. Um, feel free to shoot an email to me if it's just general, you know, how do I fill out this application? This is a situation that's, that's occurring in my household. Um, that's, that's a personal question I'm, I'm happy to answer. Um, so if that's what's maybe delaying some of the questions or maybe not, but if it is, feel free to reach out. We're here for that. Um, we'd love to see you attend the University of Denver, but you know, the information that we can provide is applicable to, to any school that you ultimately attend. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, great, great point, Alex. I know that a lot of this is quite personal and, and, and unique, right? Every situation is a little bit a little bit different. So again, we've hit it a we've hit it a thousand times in this in this presentation, but please reach out and ask those ask those questions. All right, folks. Well, I think that we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Alex, thank you so much for joining me on this. And I hope this was a great resource to you uh, who registered for this and uh, for those of you that may watch it later. Uh, have a great rest of your evening and best of luck on your college choice and application process.